Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brian Park Stage again. Um, I'm super excited to announce that Grudy Etienne will be joining us on stage here today. And he is a lead product manager at MongoDB. And I think we're all very excited to hear more about different scaling strategies available. So I'll hand it off to Grudy. There you are. Thank you. Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, can I get a thumbs up, please? Perfect. A lot of thumbs up. So awesome. All right, hey everyone, I'm Garudi. I'm a lead product manager in the core database here at MongoDB. And today I'll be talking to you about a central scaling strategy. We won't be getting into too much details. I want to make sure we cover the broad bases and explain what we have going on. And then, you know, if you have more detailed questions you want to get into, we'll take that in the Q&A at the end. So first, I'll introduce why we scale our databases. Then we'll talk about our existing scaling strategies up until this new version of MongoDB. Then we'll go into how we normally horizontally scale. Then we'll talk about the new horizontal scaling option for MongoDB 8.0. And then I'll take questions at the end. And if at any point you can't hear anything I'm saying, just raise your hand and let me know so we can make sure you're good. So first, why do we scale? There are four main reasons why we need to scale our database. The first one is around CPU. So your database is doing a lot of operations. You need to make sure you have enough processing power, whether it's processing for complex aggregations or enough processing to process a bunch of operations simultaneously. And so in order to make sure your database can handle your workload, you need to make sure you have enough processing power so that everything works fine, you're not bottlenecked or anything, and you know, your app isn't down or slow to your customers. Another reason may be we scale for RAM purposes. And so why do you need RAM? You want your data and memory for fast access. A lot of data you want low latency so that you, know, you can get the results fast to the user so things don't look sluggish. So you want to put a lot of that information on what we call a working set. You put that in memory so that you have quick and, uh, access to it. And so as your data grows or you have more operations, more users coming on, you want to put more and more of that information on RAM so you add more RAM to your system so that you can continue to scale if you need memory. A third reason is disk throughput. To be more specific, uh, there's a difference between disk throughput and disk I.O. I'm using them interchangeably, but you want your disk to essentially be fast. So throughput-wise, you want an individual operation that goes to disk to be fast, but disk I.O. means you can handle a bunch of operations on disk. And so you don't want your disk to be a bottleneck. This tends to be the one that a lot of folks tend to underestimate. Um, because you know you have things in RAM, you have enough CPU, you're like, I'm good. But your disk throughput and your disk I.O. is a thing that you also need to make sure you scale so that your database can handle that load. And lastly, the one that surprisingly is not the most popular one but needs to happen at some point. If your app ever gets popular enough, you may need to scale your storage, right? So to me, these are all good problems to have. Obviously, you know, cost withstanding. But usually, this is a sign that if you're scaling any of these, that your app is doing pretty well, which probably translates to you know, good business. So let's talk about what existing scaling strategies we have for databases today. The first one I'll start with is uh, vertical scaling. And so vertical scaling is what, when any of those four things you need to scale, you just get a bigger machine for it. And so here I have you know, a shard or a replica set, whichever one you want to call it. I use them interchangeably also. It's running out of any of those resources. Maybe it's running out of CPU or it's running out of RAM. What do you do? You get a bigger machine. And so imagine, for example, I have a, a shard that has you know, 8 gigs of RAM. And for some reason, that's not enough to hold all your data in memory because it's grown. You just get a new machine that now has 16 gigs of RAM. And now you have enough RAM to process your new found growth and workload. And if that's not enough, you, again, you get another bigger machine. And so as you grow and grow and grow, you just vertically scale. And the good thing about that is that you don't have to do anything with your application. You just tell MongoDB, hey, give me a bigger machine, and we'll give you a bigger machine, twice the, twice the compute and for twice the cost. And so what's the downside there? One is that it's twice the cost. So for example, you reach that 8 gig of RAM limit. Maybe you only need 10 gigs of RAM. And what we have to do is give you 16 gigs, and you're essentially overpaying. But hey, at least you have enough headroom, and you don't have to do anything. Like I said, it's very simple. Just go get a new bigger machine. You get 32 gigs and so on. So you don't get any linear scaling. It's all in powers of two. Um, but 
it's very simple. And also, another downside of vertical scaling is that a machine can only get so big, right? After a certain size, let's say, you know, a terabyte of RAM, we don't have a machine bigger than that. So then you're stuck. And also, as we've seen, a lot of customers actually let it get that big, and then they panic, like, well, I still need to go bigger than that. What do I do? And we'll get into what you need to do then. Comes my favorite scaling strategy, and not just because that's my bread and butter where I work, but because I believe it works the way it's supposed to, which is horizontal scaling. And so what is the difference between vertical and horizontal scaling? Horizontal scaling is all about you just add a shard. You just get the same small machine, you add a second one. So if you're going from the eight gigs of RAM, here it doubles also. But then when it's time to grow again, you just add another one, now it's tripled. So you go from eight gigs of RAM, let's say, to 16 gigs to 24. Instead of doubling each time now, you have linear growth and scaling. You scale your RAM. So each machine has the same amount of RAM, same amount of you know, disk storage, same amount of CPU. So you can grow any of those four things we're talking about linearly. And you can do that to essentially infinity. I'm sure there's some physical limit of physics, whatever it is. I haven't seen it yet. We've gone to 500 and seem to work. Who knows that 1,000 uh, should technically work theoretically, but we'll find out in practice. But essentially here, you get unlimited scaling horizontally. And the main complication with that is that you now need to partition uh, your database across those shards. And that requires some thinking. It's not free like vertical scaling where you just say, give me a bigger machine. Here you have to figure out how you're going to spread your data across so that you can take advantage of all those machines. And so how do you scale horizontally in MongoDB? So we'll take this example here. Up until MongoDB 7.0, the main thing we've been focused on is the concept of sharded collections. So what that means is a collection or a table is just you know one set of data. You want to take it, and you want to split it across the machines that you have. So here, for example, I had the, a collection that I call drivers. Let's say I have a taxi application. And I'm going to spread that across both shards. So here, I just took the driver's collection. I put half the data on one shard and the other half on another. And now I'm taking advantage of twice the compute that I have, twice the storage, and so on. And how do we do that? And MongoDB is just run with a command. It's called shard collection. I picked, uh, let's say, my database called taxi. So I shard the driver's collection. And the thing that you have to do with that, you have to pick a shard key. A shard key is what determines how to partition that driver's collection across the two shards. And that's the one complication with sharding is it requires extra thinking. If you pick a bad shard key, the data may not get distributed evenly. And that's not necessarily uh, horrible all the time, but you're not really fully utilizing both machines if you don't pick a good shard key. And so a shard key could be whatever you want it to be. We're pretty flexible in that. The downside with flexibility is that you, you, know, you can shoot yourself in the foot. We don't sort of tell you if it's great or not. These are things we're working on improving, by the way, helping you pick a good shard key. For example, we added that in the last version of MongoDB. But you, know, you have to think about that. And the other part is that you have to then make sure your shard keys pass through and your application so that you know, when you pass the logic, it goes to MongoDB. We know where to route it, because if you don't, what MongoDB will do is take your query, check every shard to find that document, and then send it back to you. But then if you have to check every shard for every query, you're not really taking advantage of horizontal scalability, right? Because you're not partitioning the queries. That means that both shards are getting the same traffic as before, so you're, you're just essentially wasting money at that point. And so those are the complexities around sharding a collection. And you, know, you can have multiple collections on a database, obviously. And so here, I have a writer's collection and a driver's collection. And so we're going to do the same thing again. I added a second shard. I'm going to keep the driver's collection the same. And this time, I want to shard the writer's collection. And so the way sharding works sharded collections is we take that writer's collection you sharded, we spread it across both shards evenly. And we run the same command for shard collection for writer's collection. This time, I pick writer ID and I hashed it. I assume that's random enough so that you know, the inserts go evenly across the shards, and that's split. So now you can have a MongoDB cluster that looks like this. Uh, shard 0 has you know, half of the writer's collection and the driver's collection, and shard 1 has half the writer's collection. And as I add shards, MongoDB would magically move them across shards. So if you added uh, shard 2, now you have three shards. You know, the writer's collection would have a third, a third, a third on each shard. The driver's collection would still stay on shard 0 unless you shard it. And I'll get into that part a, a little bit later, too. And so, yeah, like I said, you need to pass 
the shard key in your application and worry about that logic and think about all that, but it works you know, if you know what you're doing. And part of that is that, hey, the first part is we want to make sure it works for you. And then also like, hey, if you don't know what you're doing, we want to make sure you can do something pretty easily also, right? So we've been focused on that also. And so now we get into a new horizontal scaling option that we've added in MongoDB 8.0, the concept of moving uncharted collections. It's a thing that many customers were surprised we didn't have, and so, you know, I was surprised too. And we finally got around to it, and it was not as simple as I thought it'd be. Engineering will always tell me, like, hey, Grudy, it's not that simple. I'm like, okay, well, it finally happened. And so let's get into what that looks like. And so here, we're back with the shard that we had. We have the writer's collection and the driver's collection. And what do I want to do? I have my two shards. I say, you know what, Grudy, I don't have time to think about a shard key or pick a shard key. Instead, what if I want to do something different? I'm like, well, like what? You say, I want to keep the writer's collection on shard zero. And instead, why don't you just put the driver's collection on shard one? I'm like, yeah, why didn't I think of that? Well, you know, that's why we have customers we listen to. And we've basically made this happen. And how do you do it in MongoDB 8.0? You just run, you know, the aptly named move collection command. So what you would do is take whichever collection you want to move, in this case, the driver's collection. You say move collection to shard one. And you know, if you had a bunch of collections, you had a bunch of shards, you could do that ad finitum, right? So let's look at another example. I have eight collections here. Collections A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and H. And so I want two shards, but I could have three shards, five shards, eight shards, doesn't matter, right? And what I want to do is say, okay, you know what? I'm going to keep A, B, C, D on shard zero. And instead, I want my E, F, G, and H collections on shard one. And just put them there. And how do you do that? You run move collection. You run move collection for collection E, so it moves it there first. Then you run it again for F, then for G, then for H. We thought about having a move collections. You know, we can talk in detail after the presentation why we didn't do that. But for now, I'll give you the flexibility. You move one collection at a time, however many you want. So if you wanted just E by itself, you could do that. And yeah, so that's one piece. And what is so good about all this compared to the concept of sharding collections? Well, first, it's actually pretty fast. We managed to move a terabyte with 10 indexes in under a day. And to give you context, if you had you know, two indexes, take a couple hours. Before, in sharding collections, when you try to move that kind of data, it used to take maybe two months, maybe 30 days, depending on how many indexes you have. So we've cut that down to under a day. And we continue to make it faster every release. And so there, you can move collections pretty fast. In case you have some emergency, you're like, hey, I know this collection is getting hotter and hotter. I want it to be on its own shard. I want collection E to be by itself. I'm going to move it. You can do it now in a day. Another one is what? There is no impact on your workload. So one issue customers have complained a lot about in moving uh, chunks for sharded collections was that, hey, when I'm doing the deletes, the range deletions, it impacts my workload. So my application would get slower while I'm moving the data. And so we talked about that. And so here, for example, when you move a collection to a new shard, well, that new shard doesn't have any traffic. So there's no issue there. But for example, once I've moved collection E, if I'm moving collection F, there is now traffic from collection E already on that shard. When collection F is being moved to that shard, there's also no impact on collection E. Because the orders are insert, uh, the, the answers are in order, um, it's pretty low IO. It doesn't use that much resources, so you don't see any impact really, unless you're at like 95% utilization, which we don't recommend running that hot anyways. And lastly, I think the part that I want to really stress is the fact that there are no application changes. So now, instead of waiting to pick a shark key, figuring out a shark key, passing your application, which can take months, it usually does for a lot of customers, you can just add a shard, run the command, the thing gets moved in less than a day, then you're going about your day. And now, really, you can focus on when it's time to really get big, you want to shard an actual collection, you bought yourself a lot of time to figure out how to do that. But in the meantime, you bought yourself some scale. For example, if you had eight collections, you put one on each shard, you can go to eight shards without really doing any changes to application. That's an instant thing. So you get to scale pretty quickly. And so, how did customers do this before? What they had to do before, they had to shard all their collections. So those eight collections I showed you, you would have to shard each collection, pass the shard key there, and so on, so that you could spread them evenly. And if you wanted them on their own shard, we have this concept called zone sharding, where you say, hey, I want this collection to live on this shard, and you have to specify it. Whereas here, 
you don't have to do any of that. You just move the collection, and then it's on the shard that you move it to. And so this concept of not making any application changes is a thing that we've really pushed. And so if, but before, if you had sharded all your collections and did all that, well, you're like, what about me? It's like, well, thank you for doing things right, but uh, we want to help you. If you really want to get to this state now and you want to remove some of that logic maybe, we introduced a concept of unsharding collections. So here, looking at this example, I have two shards. This is how it would look if I had sharded both the riders and the driver's collection. So the riders' collections split, you know, uh, uh, halfway across the two shards. Same with the driver's collection. So now what we're going to say is, you know what? Why don't we unshard those collections? So let's keep the riders' collection sharded still across both shards. But now I want to unshard the driver's collection. And so this is how we'll look afterwards. And how do we do that? You run a command called unshard collection. And so you take the sharded collection that was drivers and you unshard it. Now it's a collection that lives on one shard and it's an uncharted collection on one shard. And now you have the driver's collection like this. You say, I also want to unshard the writer's collection so that I can put it on shard one and go to the way I should have had in the first place if I didn't have to shard any collections. And what do I do? I just unshard the writer's collection. And as you can guess, same command, unshard collection, the taxi writer's collection. You notice here, I did not put the shard I wanted to unchart it to. So that is an optional piece. If you don't pick a destination shard for uncharting the collection, MongoDB will pick one for you. It will find a shard that's most empty and just put it there. But you can also specify which shard you want to go to. So I could have done the two shard, shard one, it would have done the same thing, right? And so depending on whether or not you care which shard it goes to when you unchart it, you can specify the shard when you're uncharting. Otherwise, MongoDB will pick the shard that has the least amount of data to put it on. So now you're in a state where you would have been in the first place, where you would have moved the driver's or rider's collection to the other shard, and you can just unshard your sharded collections. That way you can keep them together on the same shard. So essentially, that is what we've introduced in MongoDB 8.0. The thing that I really want to emphasize is that you don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about scaling and sharding your collections until it's time to do so. So a lot of folks said, hey, I have a bunch of collections. I really just want to move them and isolate them maybe or scale them that way so that when it's time to shard a collection and pick a shard key, I will deal with that then. So for now, what we've given you is the ability to just grab an uncharted collection and move it to the shard of your choice. And that's my big introduction to what we're doing for scaling in MongoDB 8.0.